I just love, I just wish I could be in their bedrooms tonight. They're, <laughs> they're just, uh, many of them are in Connecticut. And they're that far away. If anybody's watching, if, I would just love to just be in one of their bedrooms tonight. Just what they just have got to, they're just so got to be so frightened by this. Occupy Greenwich. Because it's, right. yeah, well, it's our, as long, you know, our Bill is so right. You know, Bill has been such a warrior for trying to keep the, the bare threads of our democracy that are still there intact that we and that there aren't many left we are really just hanging on by a few of these threads and and if if, if one of those threads is one person one vote and so they can't really do anything about that and we can you know you can say oh they can buy the votes but listen every if you to take our lessons you mentioned all the previous movements in historic the historical implications of this i mean the, the women's suffrage movement that started in this state uh in the 1840s uh, they, I mean, imagine the mountain that they had to climb. You know, people didn't sit around going, well, how are we going to get this amendment passed because we can't vote? I mean, seriously, no woman was ever going to be able to vote for their right to vote. I mean, it's just, it's, it, that must have seemed like the most impossible task. So we, what's great about, what's great about this movement is, <laughs> what's great about this movement is, is that we have to get out of our, our victim role you know, this is why the word, the concept of Occupy, because Occupy until seven weeks ago was really a dirty word because we knew what it meant. <laughs> Those lands that are occupied by us in the Middle East, the West Bank and Gaza by another country, you know, I mean, it's like, that's, <laughs> occupation, occupation is a dirty word. And you have, you have taken this and you've just, all of us, everybody's a part of this, every, we've turned it on its, on completely on its ear and now we've owned the word and it's not like, it's not like, whoa, what are, what are we gonna do? <laughs> you know, it's like, no, we've occupied you now. We've occupied the Washington Post. We've occupied the Wall Street Journal. We're, and and that's, how, that's how this is gonna go. But I just please want to second what Naomi said that this is the no kidding around moment. Don't, my friends, please, the ship has sailed in. The ship will leave. As Bill said, many of these things that have happened in our 200 plus year history um, have failed or been crushed. And this is our moment. This is, this is the moment for it to happen. It will only happen if every single person in this room Tonight, when you leave and you go home, you have to say to yourself, what am I doing? What can I do to be part of the occupation? What am I going to do to occupy Wall Street? Everybody watching this at home, on the nation's website, anybody watching this right now, every, every one of you, it doesn't matter, you're living in Boise, you're living in, 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 the, in the most faraway reaches of upper Minnesota, no matter where you are, I've, I've seen occupies that are two people big. <laughs> and it, this is where it's got to start. And it always starts that way, right? I mean, uh, Marx, yeah. he just had angles. They were just, <laughs> that's all he had. I mean, it was like, they were, just, they were just two old farts sitting around keeping their hands warm over the fireplace in London, <laughs> talking shit to each other. And, and they... You know, they came up with this idea. Uh, and, 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 and JC, JC had 12 Fisher guys. Look what happened with that, whoa. <laughs> so, so if you're at home and you're watching this and you're in some out of the way place, you already own it. This is already your country. You, 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 you have been occupied by Wall Street. Your homes have been occupied by Wall Street. Your government has been occupied by Wall Street. Your media has been occupied by Wall Street. And it's okay for you to say, not anymore. Those days are over. End of story. Bill, uh, I, know you, I know you had your hand up, Bill, and I, I'm going I'm to get to you to, to discuss this, but I wanted to weave in some questions now also. So this is one that I think I'm going to pitch to you, Bill, to, to fold in. There have been a couple questions here. Um, 
How do you see Occupy fitting into the upcoming 2012 elections? Um, do you think Occupy Wall Street should feed into candidacies outside of the ineffective neoliberal two-party system, a third party, question mark? Um, how do you see campaign finance reform as part of the solution? So, Bill, you've written about these issues, thought about third parties, and I'm going to ask you about them. You know, I think uh, this is why I keep going back to Larry Goodwin's very precise description of how a movement moves through sequences of development. And talking about next year's election is way out of line with the development of this movement, way out of line. And, and uh, I, let me take off on what Michael was saying. There's a broader way for this movement, whatever it will call itself, to have profound political impact. And that's an old fashioned political maneuver called fear. We need to put fear in the hearts of the regular system with the purpose of liberating the political system. I mean that literally. Not just want to liberate the country from the suffocation and, and uh, propaganda of, of, the, of the economic system, but, we, but at the same time need to break free the representative system and perhaps change it profoundly. Uh, the second point, uh, I talked about con democratic conversation, and this is hard. We need to learn how to have a democratic conversation with people who ain't like us. And, uh, and, uh, and, and my, my conviction is, I, I, I'm not looking for evidence in polling or any place else, but I have a belief that we have natural allies who are in fact on the other side of the fence and we're throwing things at each other. And I, I don't want to overstate that because a lot of them are not going to be allies. They're, they're out to kill us, or, or at least to crush us. But, but I, I, would, I urge you to, to do some sampling. And I, now I'm going to make it harder. The most obvious uh, grouping that might be worth dipping into is the Tea Party movement. Um, not, not easy to do for obvious reasons, but nevertheless, I'm convinced that if they understood what they are being sold and what they are being told is their objective, they would say, no, no, not me. I'm not on that. And, uh, and the second group, almost as difficult, but, but more accessible maybe, is small business. And that's a very conservative group of people. Uh, I know enough of them to know that underneath the ideological framework, they agree with us on a lot of big stuff, including globalization, including uh, including the way the big corporations push them around and push the country around. The third group is the real stretch. Hold your applause. <laughs> we need to talk to the military. And I mean, I mean the people from, from the bottom up. Changing of the guard. Changing of the guard, okay. Well, we can, we can both be for a smaller, more peaceable national defense strategy, and at the same time f discover that a lot of the people in uniform feel and know that they are, they are the victims of this manipulation too. And uh, yeah. I, I want to ask Patrick and, and, and Rinku, because Pat, Patrick, you mentioned the Tea Party in your, in your opening statements, and we have a question here. You know, how can and should the Tea Party be pulled in to be a part of Occupy Wall Street? Well, I mean, I think that it's uh, to a degree already happening. Um, we have a bunch of people down there who carry around Ron Paul signs or, and the Fed signs. <laughs> and, you know, I think all of us have, or at least I, I, I do, have uh, issues with those, uh, with, with, well, with Ron Paul and some of his, his, his ideas. Um, but you know the, these are people that are are very easily accessible for our movement. I think if we approach it the right way, because these are people who have been as screwed over by the system as everyone else, and who are more pissed off about it than most people. And you know, they they think that they've uh, gotten a solution, which has been uh, an involvement in the Republican Party and a supposed shift of of their message, but. In reality, they haven't shifted the message at all. And I, I think that that brings us back to the question about uh, this movement's involvement with the state. And 
I think, personally, it's very important that we don't become involved with parliamentary procedure and parliamentarianism. Um, I can understand the impetus to work from the government, but I think that the government, in its current form at least, is itself a very corrupting institution. And especially if we can't, or especially now that, that Wall Street is so firmly firmly ingrained in it. You know, like over the past 30 years, the actions of the Fed, the actions of Goldman Sachs have gone hand in hand. You know, we have these large financial institutions that are essentially running our money. And, you know, as long as that's the case and as long as they're running our campaign finances as well, you know, we're never going to win anything. We, we, we elected Obama. I think a lot of people in this room probably helped with that. And, he, he had more donations from Wall Street than any other candidate ever. And, you know, he, we, we elected a person who ran on change and hope, and now I don't, I don't, have, I don't, I don't see too much change, and I don't have too much hope for him. Um, and so, you know, I think that, that what we're seeing is a rejection of this political binary, but also just the entire way of doing things. You know, this, this representation from other individuals as long as they're more influenced by the money that comes into the system than they are to the voices that come into the system or the votes that come into the system, which is the way things are right now, we, we can't use the government. And, and that was the failure of the Tea Party. They had uh, a, a soapbox to, to, to make their, you know, their voices heard. And then as soon as they joined up with this institutionalized party, their voices were immediately uh, silenced and replaced by the same chorus of Republican, you know, ideology that has, has existed for, for many years in that party. So, I, you know, again, this is, this is my personal opinion. You know, I, nothing I say up here is reflective of the movement as a whole. But I think personally that's something to be very, very worried about, becoming the Tea Party. <laughs> So, Rinko, to you, what, what about, what about this, this sort of Tea Party alliance that, that have some people salivating? You know, I think one of the signal polls for me early on was, was when you polled Tea Party people, um, a great majority of them said that the government is making too much of the problems of African Americans. Um, is, this, is this a kind of uh, movement that can join with Occupy movements? All this talk about the Tea Party, it really reminds me of this thing that happened that I experienced actually about 10 years ago. Uh, it was New Year's Eve and I was going to a party that was a potluck and I had gone to the grocery store to buy a pot roast because I was going to make pot roast, which I think is the most American piece of meat you could possibly buy <laughs> um, at the butcher shop. So I'm standing in a Safeway in California. I'm by the meat. I'm looking at all the meat. And there are two white people, middle-aged white people, standing right next to me. And I guess that the union that had been in that grocery store had just been decertified and lost. The workers had lost their union. And the white woman was saying, t telling the story to the white man and saying it's, you know, she was really angry about it. And she said it's really messed up that that happened and we lost our union. And, you know, I'm, I'm like nosier than I should be, I'm sure, and I, I eavesdrop a lot because I was an organizer and then a journalist, so I like to listen to everything. And so I'm overhearing them. I'm standing. They're, they're like where Naomi is. And so I butted in and I said, listen, I couldn't help overhearing your conversation and I've done a lot of work with unions over time and I just wondered what, which union was it? Was it the United Food and Commercial Workers or was it someone else? And the, neither one of them answered me, but the woman looked at me, she looked at me and then, but she spoke to her friend and she said, but now those blacks and Latinos, or she might have said those blacks and immigrants, now they can just get all the welfare that they want. And, uh, you know, as a, someone who's worked on racial justice for 25 years now, 
Uh, it makes me very nervous to think about purely local control because purely local control for people of color has quite often meant that you went to segregated schools and you couldn't get a job and your housing was substandard and nobody would do anything about it. So people of color have needed the federal government in particular and to have some federal standards so that local <laughs> control didn't amount to us having our labor and our housing and our food and our uh, whatever little goodies we had stolen. And so it seems to me, you know, I like my government, I want it back. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to give it up to somebody who thinks that the only role of government is to make the 1% richer and to take other people's stuff for that 1%. So I think that we have to have a, um, we have to do a couple of things. One is, uh, in the public will building project that we're all now a part of, since we all occupy everything, um, in that public will pro project, we need to be able to explain to that white lady who thought that there was absolutely nothing that she had in common with me, that um, it's the same government that allowed that union to be easily decertified, that also actually took away welfare, not just from people of color, but from white people too, mostly white people who really needed it. And it's that same government that we need to get back in order to protect working people of all colors. <laughs> so I'm not quite ready, uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not ready to, um, I think the government we have now is not the government that we need to have, and it's not the one that we must have. I think changing it is entirely possible. I feel so much more hopeful about that now than I did two or three months ago, so thank you very much. <laughs> uh, but we have to have a discussion about the government that doesn't just reinforce its uh, crappiness, you know, because that, <laughs> that, that reinforcement just makes wider openings for libertarians. And I don't think that libertarianism and anarchism are the same thing, right? Anarchism is about self-governance and elevating, elevating people's ability to be in community and work things out. Uh, whereas libertarianism is every man for himself and you're just totally on your own. So I, I try to draw a lot of distinctions between those two things and I think that for people of color in particular and also for working people, you've got to have some form of governance that, prote that is about protecting us uh, from having all our stuff taken. <laughs> yeah, Michael. And uh, I just want to add a couple points uh, to, the, to that. The, the Tea Party, as it exists now, is a Koch brothers a funded, uh, a, you know, group. It's not that the, uh, the Tea Party at the beginning may have had a number of, of well-intended working Americans concerned about what was going on after the crash, but it quickly morphed into a racial thing, um, uh, very much against Obama. And um, so it's very hard to talk. Uh, to these people, but um, you know, Thanksgiving is coming up, and you all have a conservative brother-in-law. Um, <laughs> there's someone in your family that's a Republican, and you're going to be sitting at the same table. And so, let me just make a quick suggestion: what you can do uh, to help build the movement. And I've learned it basically by being down at Liberty Square and talking to these Ron Paul people, <laughs> and uh, which they're very. I like. I enjoy talking to them. And what I say to them uh, is: is this. Um, we have more in common than not. You know, if we really got out a, a piece of paper, drew a line down it, and made a list of the things that we care about in life, we really share more than the things that we're opposed to. So why don't we agree to disagree on the things that we don't agree on? If you don't want to have an abortion, don't have one. Yeah. You know, if, 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 I don't want, if I don't want 12 guns in my cabinet, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to get them. You'll skip the gun uh, show. I'm not going to go to the gun show. Um, if, if, if you don't want to have sex with another man, uh, for God's sake, don't do it. Uh, you know, <laughs> but, if, but if those two guys want to have sex, what do you care? 
Well, you know, it's, it's like, let's, I think that's a good way to try to approach those who are on the, the other, on the other side, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste a lot of time on it, and this is why. Uh, America has changed. It's not about that middle-aged white couple in the supermarket anymore. Barack Obama won with a 10 million vote margin, three times what Bush beat Kerry with, um, and he lost the white vote, all right? 57% of white men voted for McCain. 53% of white men voted for, um, 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 I'm sorry, white women. 53% of white women voted for McCain, all right? Barack Obama lost every white age demographic except 18 to 29 year olds. Mm -hmm. That's the only, it's the only white demographic he had. So, so much of our political discussion, so much of the chat shows, the pundits, everything is, there's this sort of mythical white guy in middle America that we're trying to please <laughs> or we're trying to convince or whatever. And while, yes, he is an American too, and, and, and you should have that conversation I suggested at, at Thanksgiving dinner. But in the end, we are a different country now, and thank God for young people. And I think the success of the Occupy movement I, I want to encourage at its nuclear core that young people run this. The, the attitude that he expressed about Obama when, when he, you know, this is what's great about being young. You know, as we get older, we just, we have to learn to get along and, and we put up with a lot of nonsense. But when you're 18 or 20 or 22, you know, you don't, you don't suffer any fools and you don't take, you don't take any BS. And so when Obama says he's, you know, going to do things, and then two years later he hasn't done it, people, well, young people didn't show up in 2010. Thank you. In some way, I mean, it's been really rough, but I'm, I'm glad that young people don't tolerate this crap and will just go, Dad, <laughs> you, you said you were going to close Guantanamo. <laughs> <laughs> he, I worked the phone banks for you. I knocked on doors. We need that energy. We need that. We need that. And 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 uh, the 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 final thing I want to say is in terms of if we if there's anything we should need to do politically, it's to get that constitutional amendment passed that that says corporations are not people. And that has such wide support across the country. We and. And in that, in that same amendment, we need to take money out of politics. Once, once we do these two things, once we do that, then, then the 400 can't, can't control it. Uh, so th I just, those are the things I wanted to add. Thank you. Actually, Rinko, go ahead. Just, just a couple of quick things. I mean, um, you know, I don't want to be with that white couple because I think I need them to win. It's clear that I don't need them to win. We, people of color, are rapidly becoming the absolute majority in this country and certainly in the lower, in the uh, newer generations, that's more and more true. But I think I need to be able to relate to them because they're my neighbors, because whatever I build, they're going to be there and uh, we're going to either move forward really, you know, in this antagonistic uh, relationship or we're going to move forward um, in a more together way. Am I going to get all of them? No, absolutely not. But it seems important to try to get as many as, yeah, as possible. As um, and right. And <laughs> there, there is a way. And then run, yeah. There, but they might make good pot roasting, which I might want the recipe. Um, the red meat is <laughs> But <they're>, sorry. <laughs> I'm so not a vegetarian. We could put them on the bicycles at least, you know? And the thing is, there is a way for the 400 to control, to change the one person, one vote thing, and that's called voter suppression. It happens all the time. It happened last, just two days ago on Tuesday. We've got voter ID laws now in many states, too many states, and the federal government, the Department of Justice, is, has decided not to challenge voter ID laws, the ones that say you must have a driver's license or your birth certificate in order to show up and vote. So, uh, so I just think, you know, triumphalism, 
I, I, I'm so into this moment. I, I'm, I'm more excited than I've been in a long time. But I think that we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. There's a lot of work still yet to do uh, every day in every part of the country. And, um, and we just have to do it, I think, more than think about what's coming. Just, just do the work every day and worry not so much about how we're going to win, whether we're going to win, when we're going to win. We're going to win if we do the work. Okay. So I have a, there's a question for Bill and Naomi coming up that's a, that's a whopper, but I want to I get Patrick, I, I, we have to ask you this because it's very important, yes. and I want to make sure we have the time for this. Question to you. How are you going to weather the winter at Liberty Square, and how can we help you? Okay. Um, well, I'll answer, the, the, this, I'll answer that in reverse order. You can help us uh, by going to occupywallst.org slash donate. We have uh, donation links for every single occupation, it's very, or as many as we can get. It's very important that we, we feel that you don't just focus on us. We have $500,000. There are places that don't have very much money at all. But we also have uh, you know, uh, uh, things that you can actually buy and send to us, which is, I think, preferable. Um, tents and, and so forth. But you know, igloos aren't illegal. Uh, so there's always that. But is, is it true? I heard that there's there, some people came from Occupy Anchorage uh, to provide some consultation on how to do winter. Uh, and I heard that I, I don't know if this is true, but I heard that there's an ice company in New Jersey that has actually offered if you want to build igloos, they'll provide the ice uh, for these igloos. But that's just that's the crazy nature of this. Some ice guy in New Jersey is just going, I'm going to occupy with my ice, you know. Yeah, I, yeah I, I don't know about that, but I know that there are many different uh, organizations that are very interested in helping us uh, uh, maintain our position throughout the winter. And I think it's very important. You know, there have been people who have said that, that we could potentially leave the space and occupy, you know, the internet or... or Something warmer. Yeah, from the inside <laughs> of our houses. I think that's right out. I think we need to maintain our space. I think that the, the way that we... The way that we've distinguished ourselves from protests is that we don't leave. You know, this is this is a something that we can't just go home at the end of the day from. You know, I mean, I try every once in a while, and it doesn't really work. Um, but it, this this idea that winter will be hard, but we're we're so dedicated. You you go down there, and you can just feel it. You know, radiating off of these people, the dedication. When when there was the that freak snowstorm. That happened, you know. We we just buckled down, you know. It was it was sleeting horizontal, and and people were just you know staying there and, and occupying the space and making sure that we held the square, you know. That's that's important to us. We took that square. We're not we're not giving it up. So here here's a here's a question that I think both both Naomi and Bill could could shed light on. Um, uh, it says, Iceland's response to its financial crisis has been the opposite of austerity. It basically just said, screw you, Europe. Um, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, this has not been a model here, and it's not been really discussed here in, in, in the U.S. So I wanted to ask both of you, you know, is this, is this um, what can we learn, you know, from other, other places that have sort of resisted austerity? And, and not just not just Iceland, but in Argentina in, in 2001 and, and other places. What are, what are the sort of models out there that are global? <laughs> um, well, I think there, yeah, there are certainly, um, there, there are good examples and there are also warnings. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a troubling moment. And I, and I mean, if we look at what's happening now in Greece and Italy, um, you know, I don't. I don't want to be a downer because you know I think that that uh, this is an incredible moment. But Europe has been in revolt now for a couple of years, uh, occupying plazas and and really fighting like they mean it. Um, and and they're getting they're they're they are getting stomped on right now. Um, the 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 dangers of, of of globalization and what it has done to democracy. I mean, this was always the reason why we opposed these trade deals, was that they massively reduced the democratic maneuvering space 
in countries. And you see this so clear within the European Union where everyone's united in a single currency. They don't, you know, they've done this trade. You're allowed to vote, but we are going to maintain control over all of the economic levers. And that was, that was always the deal. You hollow out democracy, you outsource the running of the economy to a technocratic class. Um, and look at how little maneuvering space Greece has, Italy has. Um, and the solution now being proposed is an outright assault on democracy in those countries. Now Greece is run by a banker who has not been elected to a single post. Same thing is happening in Italy. Um, and you can't say it's because they didn't fight. They did fight. Um, and they are still fighting. There are structural, there are structural barriers um, that, 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 that turn democracy into a joke. And that's why, you know, what, what Michael was talking about, about corporate personhood, I mean, what we need to be doing is identifying what are the barriers to real democracy in this country. Um, and I agree completely with Patrick. This is not about running candidates. This is not about just um, you know, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, right? I mean, people had a hell of a lot of hope uh, for Obama and really thought they were going to get that change. A lot of people did. And why didn't it happen? Because of these structural barriers. So if there's, I think this movement absolutely should be intersecting with structures of power, but where it makes sense to intersect is once you identify, okay, what are the biggest barriers? So campaign finance, corporate personhood, media concentration. I mean, also advertising. Um, we need, we, there needs to be much, much stricter regulation uh, on advertising and political advertising and, and corporate speech and all of that. So we need to do that. This is what the Europeans are going to need to do to get control to, to, get, to get their democracies back to the extent that they had them in the first place. And they need to deepen their democracies because we're, we are, the, the limits of neoliberal democracy are just so dramatic, be, dramatically exposed in this moment. And, you know, look, Greece's referendum was, uh, the, the idea of holding a referendum on the terms of the bailout was very manipulative. It, it was, it, you know, it, it was not going to be a fair vote in the first place. But in that moment, when the whole global economy reels back in revulsion at the idea of people actually having the ability to vote on their destiny, on their economic destiny, on, on, on the decisions that are going to affect them for decades to come, you really see the way in which this economic system is at war with democracy. Um, this is our fight. And, and this is what, you know, I, was, I think about Ava, when Evo Morales was elected to, to power in Bolivia, um, he said, I'm a prisoner in the presidential palace because I'm locked in by all of these neoliberal laws. I can't do what people elected me to do. And he tried to systematically take away some of those constraints. Um, in Argentina, I think Argentina is a really good example. Yeah. Um, you Just know, tell it, us about that. Well, yeah. I mean, in, in Argentina, I, I keep thinking about Argentina. We were, we were there um, after the economic crisis in 2001. We made a documentary film called The Take um, about uh, workers whose factories were being shut down in the midst of the economic crisis. And rather than uh, the, the prospect of becoming unemployed in, in, in the middle of an economic crisis where I think 80% of the country was unemployed, the prospect of that was so terrifying that people just just simply refused to be fired. Um, and they just camped out in their factories. One of the factories we, we, we followed, the Brooklyn Clothing Factory, they stayed because they didn't have bus fare home. So they stayed in their, in, by their machines. These were seamstresses, many of them immigrants. And they, they decided to just wait until the bosses came back and at least gave them bus fare to go home. But the bosses never came back. So they were like, well, we do know how to work these machines. Um, <laughs> And so they started making suits, which is what the factory, made. and they, sort of, they started paying the debts and paying the bills, and suddenly they had a working factory. So we followed a few of these stories. Um, what, what happened in Argentina in that moment is instructive on a, on a bunch of levels. Um, so because I lived there for those two sort of incredible years when there were neighborhood assemblies, hundreds of them at every street corner in Argentina, that's what this moment reminds me of. I never thought I would see it in this country. And when we screened the take in 2004, you know, in audiences, you know, at the film forum in New York, I remember the discussion afterwards, we showed the film, first question, every screening, 
Okay, that's very nice for them, but do you think this could ever happen in America, or do things need to get really bad? And we would always say, no, they don't need to get, you know, I hate this idea that things need to get really bad before people are going to react. I mean, what a horrible idea. But, I mean, <laughs> when you, we show the take now, and we're actually showing the take tomorrow at Occupy Wall Street, people do not react like that. They just take notes. They're like, yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> we're there. They're bad. Um, but... What's interesting is that, so you had this explosion of participatory democracy in Argentina. Um, the slogan of the occupied factories was occupy, resist, produce, okay? The first stage is you, you occupy your factory. Um, the second stage is you resist police repression <laughs> because it's gonna come, right? And the way you resist p police repression is you make friends with all your neighbors. Um, you turn yourself into a community project. And that meant, you know, for one of the factories, th they were producing tiles. That meant giving tiles to the hospitals and schools and things like that. Um, so that when the police came, they had slingshots, they, um, which with the ceramic tiles. Um, but they didn't actually have to use them because there were so many hundreds of people outside their factory that the police just turned around and left, just like at Occupy Wall Street when they tried to evict them. But the third piece of it was produce, was produce. Um, and what's interesting, looking back on that political moment, is that the neighborhood assemblies, which were just about the, the experience of direct democracy in the moment, um, sort of fell apart because they didn't find a way to intersect with structures of power and the, and the bigger political conversation that was happening in the country. Um, and, and so when the economy recovered a bit, they, 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 they disappeared. But the factories are still there. 200 occupied factories are still there. They're still growing. Um, and, and, and so I think there is a lesson in that about, about the next stage for this movement, that there has to be some kind of a producing stage. Um, and you know, producing can mean all kinds of things. But, it, but, but the occupying mm -hmm. and the resisting isn't enough um, to, to, to last for the long haul. Um, yeah. Phil, I wanted to get to you on this question. Uh, listening to Naomi remember uh, Argentina reminds me that I sent her or, or her husband, Avi Lewis, who's sitting over there, a sort of forlorn email saying, you guys are down there on the barricades seizing factories with the workers, and I'm back here in Washington in America writing sappy little sermons about worker ownership. <laughs> you know? I mean, I felt like time had passed me by. Let me make two quick suggestions for discussion that could be strategies that would resolve some of what we've all been talking about here. <clears throat> One is what Michael was mentioning was a constitutional amendment on money <laughs> in politics and, and, and the personhood of corporations. We could, in an hour of conversation, we could make a pretty good list of 10 or 12 constitutional amendments that ought to be on the table. And they, of course, that's extremely difficult to accomplish. It takes years. But as the right has always understood, they are marvelous organizing tools. And you can be selective about it. You could start, actually, with FDR's Second Bill of Rights in 1944 and, and ask publicly, how come these didn't all come true? Some of them did, you know. And, and out of that conversation, make a strategy around it which will speak to people everywhere across these boundaries. Because they would, what they would say is, we know the federal government will run out on what its commitments are under certain pressures. And labor rights is one of the obvious examples. They've done that. They just destroyed the meaning of the Wagner Act, which was 80, 78 years old. So we're going to, the, to put in the Constitution rights that have not yet been expressed there. That's one possible strategy. The other one is more immediate and, and I think tangible. And that is, uh, it's, in, it's in Europe, it's, but it's in this country as well, and that is debt forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I had a, uh, a piece in the, uh, in the nation uh, a week or two ago called uh, Jubilee American Style. And Jubilee, as you know, is the biblical, uh, actually ancient civilization, Israel, Babylon, a whole bunch of others in the Middle East worked out a genuine economic slash moral 
uh, answer to inequality where the, the usurer gets everybody's property because they've failed on their debts, that's happening right now in America. It's happening right now, writ large in Europe. And yes, we can go to the barricades, but, but the real solution is to write down those debts. And you can do that for college loans. You can do it for, especially for mortgages. You can, you can make your own strategy and, and proposal about it. But I say this with, with enthusiasm. I'm always too enthusiastic about these things. But I actually think this issue is going to be at the center of our politics before this trouble is over. How, how big is that problem, Bill? The 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 well, it's, crisis it's, and it's the a, it's a moral it's a moral imperative, obviously, with the people's lives being destroyed by by debts they can't repay and debts which the banks will never collect, because these are dead. This is dead debt paper, and in and in capitalism, when that happens, if the players are big enough, they work it out. That's what the bankruptcy law is about. That's what the, the right, right outs, workouts are about with bonds and big banks and so forth. It's only when you come to people in their homes or their, their personal debts that the law is strict and says, no, 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 it would be immoral to write down your debts. You have to pay every last penny. That's what's going on right now in America, and it's really obscene. These banks know they're not going to collect on these failing mortgages, but they squeeze the, the homeowners till they get the last drop. Yeah. And this is ancient and sin. It really, there's no other word for it. So I think, I'm just suggest. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm gonna be the last person to say what this amorphous movement should do. It will decide well enough on its own. But it's something to look at. Could you mobilize right now? Uh, you wanna know what we're for? We're for forgiving the debtors. That's what the Bible says. Let's do it that way. And, and, uh, and don't fall into the, to the regulatory language that, the, uh, for, unfortunately, our mm -hmm. White House is depending on and our Treasury Secretary. And they'll all explain how, well, that's terrible. You're, you're undermining your moral hazard. If you forgive somebody their debts, next thing you know, you'll make the bankers pay, pay back their money. Right? <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> that's the moral hazard, of course. The bankers have already been forgiven in America. Yeah. True, Michael, did right? you want to weigh in? I, I just wanted to, yes, just echo what, um, what Bill said about um, students. Um, it's a crime that uh, we send 22-year-olds not out into the world, but into a debtor's prison. They're in a virtual debtor's prison from the minute they leave school. And, and while that, that leads to... Um, a, a, you know, very a crushing blow to them personally, but I want to just say a word about how it affects us as a society. Um, if, you know, our, if our young people are not allowed in their youth to explore, uh, to experiment, to discover, I mean, this is, I, I'm just, I wonder what, what's the next great invention that we're not getting or, the, or the, what cure or what, what piece of culture what music, what, you know, the things that young people used to do, the things that when they, when they were, when they didn't have, when they weren't saddled with this debt, um, they did things, they created things, and it moved the society along. It made things better for people. And I wonder what we're missing out on um, from what great genius idea or mind or whatever is, that is sitting there tonight more concerned about how to make this month's loan payment uh, uh, something that they're going to have to worry about for the next, some of them, for 20 years yeah. or longer. And it, 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 uh, I think it, it affects all of us. In, in a, uh, and I, I, I agree with you. I just think that's a, such a great idea. And I think, it's a, I think it's one idea that will resonate with so many Americans um, because everybody wants their kids to be able to, to go out into life um, uh, not in a debtor's prison. And I think that, that people will really, would really respond to that. I think more ideas like that <clears throat> will um, will help build this uh, tsunami against uh, Wall Street in the banks. Yeah. I, I, so I'm going to ask I'm going to ask a final question that that we're going to go down the line, and I, hopefully you could weave whatever you're going to say into this. And this is a sort of amalgam of of questions, but I think it's a good to, one to end on. Um, you know, which is when you're down there at Liberty Square, you feel incredibly powerful. It's an amazing feeling, right? And then you walk a few blocks away. And it's like 
people coming home from Wall Street, going to Century 21 to look for shoes, shopping, <laughs> you know. Um, and you start to feel lonely, right? Um, so so here, here's a question. What is the biggest problem or obstacle facing the Occupy movement now? What is it preve what's preventing it from growing even bigger? And what can we do about it when we leave here today? Um, so Patrick, I'm going to ask you to take that first. Sure. Um, OK, well, this is going to sound a little confusing probably at first. But I think the biggest problem is Liberty Square. I think the biggest problem is the fact that people think that that's where the occupation of Wall Street happens. That's not where it happens. It happens wherever you choose that it happens. And so Michael was talking about how two people together make an occupation. One person by themselves makes an occupation. You know, this isn't something that should stop at Liberty Square. This isn't something that once your town has a single occupation, you should stop at. This should turn into neighborhood assemblies. This should turn into occupying uh, you know, where you work, sit down strikes for everyone. And, and th this is the reality that we're facing, is that if we don't start to really, really, really change things, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to ever. You know, and that's, we're, we're getting to that moment. Very, you know, the ship is gonna leave, like, like you said. And I'm, I think everyone here is on board that ship already, or, or most of us at least. And so it's, it's, you know, very much our duties to carry this forward, to make sure that this doesn't stop. You know, because if, if this is Liberty Square, that can be stopped. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this right here, talking about these ideas, making these ideas reality, as long as we make sure that that doesn't stop, we will keep winning. Naomi, Naomi, did you, or Bill, did you want to address, you know, that, that question, what, what do you think the sort of biggest obstacle is and, and what can people do now when they leave here? Moi? I'm, I'm asking this of I all just, of you. Uh, so I just uh, mentioned, um, and I, I, I repeat my sappy, mushy American confidence, I think people, Americans are capable. They, they can answer these questions pretty much for themselves. But I just mentioned out of our past again, the populace in a few short years had alliances in every county through a dozen states. They elected some governors, they elected some senators, they had a bunch of members of the House of Representatives. But to get there, they didn't start in politics. In fact, they resisted going into politics. They started by educating themselves in conversation. And by the, at the peak of that movement, they had they had lecturers in every congressional district who were just people who understood the agenda and understood the arguments over the agenda and would go to meetings and explain them to people. They had something like 40,000 lecturers in the country at the height of the movement. They had their own newspapers, one of which was called the National Economist, which was the authority on reforming monetary policy. This is way before the Federal Reserve was created. And their ideas, were let, pushed aside by the banking community since they didn't want democratic money <laughs> and they didn't get it with the Fed. But they, but they had a group called the National Reform Press Association, who were some of which were little ragtag weekly newspapers that sometimes didn't make it to the stand. But they had, Larry Goodwin wrote, the only thing that united these reform journalists was their poverty. And that's, and that's what we have to look for now. The only thing that needs to unite us now is that sense that we've expressed tonight again and again, the spirit that this is not the country that we wanted and, and it's not the country we will endure. We will change this country and go with that without worrying about who defines it when. Sorry, we're gonna we're gonna proceed with the panel, and you could you could. There's gonna be a time if you want to come up afterwards to ask the panelists questions. Thank you. 
Um, I, th I think the biggest obstacle is our, our own bad habits, so just falling back on our, uh, on our, on our habits, which are pretty much fear-based. Because I think that, um, like I said at the beginning, this is a thrilling moment, but it's also a terrifying moment. I mean, if, you th if the task is to figure out how to rein in ephemeral virtual global capitalism, let alone transform it, Okay, let alone doing what we need to do to actually deal not just with the economic crisis, but the ecological crisis, which means to challenge the entire ideology of endless growth and acting as if we can grow forever on a finite planet. I mean, nobody's ever figured out how to do this, right? So we have to start from the premise that we are in uncharted territory. I and mean, we can draw little bits of inspiration and say, you know, Argentina defaulted on their debt. That was good. Iceland's doing some interesting things. But actually, on the global scale, in terms of what we're talking about, in the belly of the beast, no, it's never been done. And that is terrifying. And when people are terrified, they there is a tendency to just do what you know, right? I mean, when I spoke at Occupy Wall Street for the first time, you know, I spent a lot of the, the talk, uh, to talk uh, uh, encouraging people to, to really treat each other with kindness. Um, because when you, when you pick a fight with the most powerful interests in, in, the, in the history of the world, which is what has happened down there, um, you know, there is always going to be a tendency to pick a fight with somebody you know, where you have a little bit of a better chance of winning, like the person sitting next to you, you know? Um, so that's one of our bad habits on the left. We know that. We do this. We, you know, we, we turn on each other. We're excellent at it. Um, you know, some, we, but we also um, sometimes use theory as a weapon to rationalize doing nothing. Um, and and that, that's another bad habit that, 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 that we have to be really aware of. So the, I think we are, we are our worst enemies. Um, we, need, we need to be aware that fear is driving it. <laughs> um, and, 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 and the fear is the fear of the responsibility and the potential uh, of, of this moment, of going into really uncharted territories. At the same time, what's so exciting about, about Occupy Wall Street is that spirit of creativity that infuses the whole project um, and the integration of art um, and, and experimentation and it is so important, um, and it's important because it encourages that 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 uh, that, that courage to go into uncharted territory. Um, so all the things that are sort of easy to make fun of, the sort of flakier parts of it, they're in they're they're integral to the success of of, of this movement. I think. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> Rinko. So. Um, I just have to take this opportunity to give a shout out to my colleagues from the Applied Research Center who are here, my board chairs. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm so in love with my coworkers right now because uh, they are so optimistic and hardworking and, and doing such important work. I think the biggest obstacle, my biggest fear for the movement is that it will, um, that it might eventually give in to the pressure to stop using consensus because uh, more hierarchical and more traditional organizations don't use it. They use some kind of modified hierarchy. That's certainly true for us. And it works for us for what we're trying to do, but I think that consensus is so critical to the Occupy movement and it's so, it's such an important experience to have if, if if the people in this audience and the folks watching at home have not actually experienced it, I'd really urge you to go and put your body down there and, and be part of making some decision. It might take four hours and you'll be, and at the end of four hours you'll say, wow, that went by really fast and look, we have a decision and we're all in it together. So I think uh, one real obstacle will be holding on to that when there's tons of pressure, time pressure, um, political mm -hmm. pressure, pressure from allies, and pressure from within, probably, mm -hmm. to do something more "quote unquote" efficient. Michael, so more last that. words. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I should I'm, never I'm, say that to Michael Moore. No, <laughs> last words. No, I'm just I'm just so giddy uh, with optimism, and I and I want to encourage the cynics uh, out there that 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 we need to put aside the cynicism uh, for a while. And, and, the, and the sort of shared belief that we have 
that um, we don't really have any control over this. The whole thing, we're screwed. It's all, it's, it's all of this. You need to really just, even, just try optimism. Just try <laughs> being optimistic <laughs> about this. Even if, even if it, it won't kill you, first of all. I can tell you it won't kill. I, 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 I just had my first tomato about three years ago. I swear to God, I'd never eaten a tomato. And it didn't kill what? me. And I was like, you know, and then I had a second one. And then I had a third one. And, but I had, to, I, had to, I had to try that first one. And so I'm encouraging you to try a different method and to, and to learn from um, uh, the kids. Because the kids are all right. And <laughs> the, uh, um, and, and, and let me just give you two or three practical things that maybe you can do when you leave here. Again, let me just say, you, because there is no leader of this movement, and that everyone is a leader in this movement, and that, and that we, you know, we've referred to Patrick here as being from Occupy Wall Street, but he'll be the first to tell you that you're from Occupy Wall Street just by the fact that you're here tonight. So we're all Occupy Wall Street. And when you go home tonight, if you live a block away from here, you know, tomorrow morning, you can start Occupy 13th Street. <laughs> you know, you can just go down the block and talk to your neighbors. And you can figure out what, what, would, what could Occupy 13th Street do? Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's, again, it's, maybe we need to cut up our credit cards. Maybe we need to join the credit union. If, if you need a credit card, you can get one through them. Maybe it's the candidate that's running for office, uh, for Congress, in this next election. 13th Street demands that whoever is running for the U.S. Congress not take a dime of money from the banks or from Wall Street. You know, Occupy, Wall, Occupy 13th Street says so. But, but you can do this if you're watching this tonight. If you're in Dubuque, you're in Des Moines, you're in whatever it begins with a D. You're, you're Detroit. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, that's another. Oh, Detroit has been occupied <laughs> and is ready to occupy. But, uh, but it's, it, you, you have this power. And I think our biggest obstacle, Richard, is that the sense of that we're alone and the loneliness that people have felt for so long that you live in this town or on this block, you're in the PTA at school, you think you're the only one, you just gotta sit there and listen to this whatever. But you're, what I wanna tell you tonight is that you're not the only ones. That the America you live in is full of people just like you who've been going through the same struggles you've been going through and who feel the same way that you feel. This is not a conservative country. This is not a Republican country. This is a liberal, progressive country. And I'm not just saying that for purposes of rhetoric. I'm stating a fact. I'm, I'm stating an absolute fact. You go down the list of the issues on virtually every issue, other than the death penalty and maybe in one other, the American public comes down on the liberal, progressive side of these issues on every single issue. The majority of your fellow Americans have been opposed to these wars now for the last few years. The majority of Americans want stronger environmental laws, not weaker ones. Every poll shows this. The majority of Americans believe women should be paid the same as men. That's a liberal progressive issue. And in September, for the first time, the polls showed that 54% of your, your, your fellow Americans, 54% now believe that gay marriage should be the law of the land, the entire country. That's the America you live in. That's your America. So don't, don't think of this country as, you know, out there past the Hudson River, and it gets really, uh, and then you get to the Pennsylvania border, and it's really dark. Forests and crazy people. Um, and yes, there are crazy people. Uh, there could be at least 50 million of them, for all I know. But it's a big country. That means 250 million aren't crazy. It means your fellow Americans, you know, the great thing about this movement is that unlike past movements, the feminist movement, uh, the civil rights movement, you know, we have now, if you look at the polls this week, I mean, depending on which one you read, the National Journal said 59% of Americans agree in principle with what Occ Occupy Wall Street stands for. Um, and there are many polls that, where the numbers go up and down, but it's, but it's all ahead of, do, do you like Occupy Wall Street or do you like Wall Street? <laughs> and there's no poll where there's like not a two to one margin <laughs> for that. So that's the, that's this new 
movement already has the majority of Americans with it. That, you could not say that at the beginning of the feminist movement. Even in the 60s, right? You didn't have 59% of the American people with that. 59% of the American people weren't with civil rights in 1954. 59% of the American people weren't against the Vietnam War in 1964 and 65. It took years, didn't it, for those movements to succeed. This movement already has the backing, the, the, the gut-checked feeling of the majority of your, our fellow Americans. So we don't have to do that hard work of trying to convince them to come to our side. They're on our side. They're already here, and we're with them. We're on their side. So this is a gr the, 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 the fertile ground that's, that is now, now exists, the possibilities of what you can do um, are endless. And I encourage you to be creative and to think of what you can do with the Occupy movement because you're all, you've all been appointed leaders and spokespeople of this movement because everybody in this room, everybody in this room has a story to tell of what life has been like for the last decade or two or three. And you need to tell those stories. Do not think that Michael Moore or Naomi Klein or the people camped out in Liberty Square are going to be your spokespeople. We're not. You have to be your spokespeople. We are all going to do this together, and there is no stopping this. So thank you for being here, and go out and do the work that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Here is to no longer being alone, and here is to our wonderful panel this evening. Thank you for coming, everybody. Occupy.